In 2019, Crunchyroll released a trailer for an in-house animation called High Guardian Spice. It was mired for its art style and its politics, hilariously on both sides of the political spectrum, only white woman, lol, nice diversity. But perhaps most importantly and all-encompassing, most Crunchyroll subscribers felt like their money was being wasted. Arguably, most subscribers of Crunchyroll are only paying to support the creators of the thing they love as they could just pirate instead. So, most at the very least wanted their money to go towards something that actually at least resembled anime, or supported the creators of the anime they actually love. Instead, Crunchyroll did this. And I'll tell you why. This isn't aimed at you. It never was. Think about it. You're already subscribed. They don't give a shit about you. They don't care that you didn't like that the money that you were already giving them wasn't going directly to animators or to fix their service which still at the time lacked basic functions like a player not built in Flash. They have some of the most valuable and popular exclusive licenses that already forced you to have a subscription if you want to support your favorite shows legally. So why risk money investing in an original that doesn't even have a proven source material all to a target a demographic that's already subscribed to them. To me, this looks far more likely as an attempt to bring in the Western cartoon demographic than any attempt to be anime. It's especially more likely when you realize Western animation doesn't focus that much on the animation itself and is arguably cheaper to animate. In fact, it's so irrelevant that they didn't even feel the need to advertise it in the teaser. Instead, thinking that they could pull in subscribers based on advertising the politics many Western cartoons appeal to instead. It all comes together to create a very cost-effective advertisement. Hilariously though, they underestimated the backlash, presumably because they didn't realize many people just didn't pirate out of pity, <laughs> and enough people seemingly unsubscribed out of rage that they shelved the project entirely. Until now. Perhaps they were waiting until the controversy died down, or maybe it came about because of the Sony acquisition. I'm not really sure. Either way, it's out now, and I'm going to do an exhaustive critique of it. But not just for fun. Every year, I've been trying to support a charity called the Anime Dormitory Project that provide housing and cheap rent for new animators. I support them as part of the Pirates of the West movement. Basically, we pirate all of our anime and support the industry purely through charities instead as a form of boycott towards anti-competitive exclusive licenses that allow streaming services to force you onto their servers, no matter how shitty the service itself self actually is. There's a saying that all publicity is good publicity, and part of this video is probably playing into Crunchyroll's hands, but that's fine. If you're still subscribed to Crunchyroll, or any other streaming service, take it and your anger at this kind of practice and pump it into a good cause instead. Then do some research into torrenting, I promise you it's so much more easy and more convenient than streaming after you work it out. Then get a VPN, I recommend uh, Molvad, I'm not paid by them, they literally refuse to do sponsors or affiliates, that's how cool they are. Uh, and then go pirate some fucking anime. I've said it once and I'll say it again, blow this number out like goddamn water. So High Guardian Spice unfortunately isn't meme worthy bad, except for some maybe some stock images of bread and like a street lamp and some, some of the line readings. Oh it's fine. We're in break. We, we got catapulted out because of a traveler infestation. I am Slime Boy. That's what everyone calls me. I, I kind of like it. Uh, you know, it's the same slime and then boy. I got caught with ink legs in, in my dorm once. You know inkles? They're um, slimy. So, you know. I would say this show is just like bad to mediocre, with it being mediocre at the start and completely falling apart the longer it goes on. However, despite it not being perfect rant material, I very rarely got an opportunity to do very in-depth reviews where I can look into a lot of little individual moments and lines or trends, regardless of how forgettable they are, and be like, this is what I think you were trying to achieve with the scene, this is what you fucked up, this is what you actually needed to aim for, and this is how you implement it. That's not something I get to do a lot, because usually I focus on the big stuff, and I don't really get to dive in and show people the, like, the nitty gritty of my writing theories. So anyway, let's start with those trends and drill down. So our story starts with our two main characters, Sage and Rosemary, as they set off to High Guardian Academy. We get some basic character traits, energetic, bookworm, and we get some exposition about Rosemary's mother being missing slash dead. This is going to be the main attempt at depth for this character. Uh, she's sad about her mum being missing. Uh, I hope you're excited, you better be, because literally every other main character is going to boil down to my family doesn't acknowledge me. My mum's missing is the most unique character you're going to get here. In all fairness though, I do like how the main character's pink hair is actually implied to be hereditary as opposed to being main character syndrome. That's pretty fun. Uh, okay, back to criticism. The world's boring! So from here we follow Rose and Sage's journey to the magical high school of this story. The journey involves travelling on a cart, and then a bus, and then kind of an uphill train before getting on a regular train. So you can tell they're trying to put a lot of emphasis on the world itself, especially with the mystical and dramatic music that they play throughout it, and the way they react to everything. <laughs> Oh my 
god, fruit! Come on, this is a normal fucking market, why are you acting like this? You can also tell this is what they were going for because of the way they like skip the line to the train uh, by getting on their flying broomstick. So it's like, why did you do all of this? Just fly there on your broom? Clearly they're trying to instill like the same sense of wonder in their world that something like Harry Potter did on the way to Hogwarts. Uh, slight problem, the world has no creativity. Like, compare this to the journey to Hogwarts. Magical opening brick walls, ones that have minds of their own and create different crazy reactions depending on who holds them, platform nine and three quarters, illusionary walls. Hell, Harry Potter spent a whole segment just trying out different magical confectionery on the train. The whole journey to Hogwarts takes up like a quarter of the book, so with a well-built world, you could have actually spent like multiple episodes just getting to High Guardian Academy and still keep it interesting. But what you'll quickly begin to realize watching the show is that there's no effort in the world building, like at all. Like the most creative thing in this episode is the chest pet, and it will continue to be the most creative thing until the end of the season. The only thing worth mentioning, I think, is the, the couple that houses Sage and Rosemary make a brief note of their magic being somehow linked because one of them is an elf. And that sounds kind of interesting. Its conjuring powers seem unlimited. I thought it was incompatible with old magic. Aloe's an elf. So her powers merged with mine. Sweetie, she'll learn about new magic and spell theory at school. No they won't, this will never be brought up again. So what you end up being left with on this journey is a method of transportation followed by another method of transportation and sprinkled in there's a bunch of generic fantasy races. Oh hey look, there's a giant in the city, that's not unique by itself, but maybe the city will be like built to compensate for giants, or maybe the giants will have some cool method of getting around a city that's like built for like small little humans. No, this is a cardboard cutout of a giant, you will never see giants again. But don't worry, all the characters will make absolutely sure that you know when you're supposed to be amazed. We're in Lingard! Huh. What's that? We're here. Like, fuck me. Just insert creativity into what you already have. It's not like you're losing screen time. Like, okay, Lingarth's a magic-focused city, so, like, have enchanted pavement, where each cobblestone isn't joined, but, like, floats in, like, a black void. Each cobblestone is alive and can somehow, sometimes, like, move around the other cobblestones, like they're a crowd of individual cobblestones. Then, if you know or recognize a certain cobblestone by its shape or its wear and tear, its coloration, you can talk to it nicely, and it'll pass on a message to the others, and they'll bring gemstones up inside them uh, to the surface to create like a shining path leading you to your destination like some fucking GPS phone or open up a shortcut or launch you into the air you know that sort of thing or if you step on a cracked stone it'll open up like teeth and eat you dropping you into the sewer system underneath because the enchantment has been like corrupted by the crack give me give me uh give me a huge city that climbs into the air a giant light on top of it like a lighthouse that shines in all directions then have all the street lamps not contain bulbs but instead little portals in them that lead back to the giant light on the top so light shines through the portal and lights up the streets. Give me, uh, give me, give me enchanted bubble mixture that's linked to different locations. When you blow bubbles, you can see the location reflected inside it, and if it pops on someone, they get teleported to the location. Then have magical business owners stand at the tallest point in the city and blow bubbles down into the city, hoping they'll pop on people and teleport them to their businesses, like some kind of magical real-life pop-up ad. <laughs> Have business owners, like, constantly fight it out in this location with, like, magical battles, trying to hold the monopoly on the bubble advertisement. I don't fucking know. Have fun! Sorry, I had a bit of a moment here. <clears throat> Even the creativity they do attempt tends to lack a lot of depth or meaning to it. There's like, there's this door where, which could be like cool, but like, like why? And then there's the Trixies, which are basically the plot for the rest of the episode. Rosemary gets a locket stolen by a Trixie and then it uses it to attract a mate because it's shiny. And then the two of them break the locket. Honestly, I feel like I'm watching a David Attenborough fucking Cartoon Network edition. The, the, the most interesting thing about the Trixies is like they both transform halfway through, but like... It doesn't actually mean anything or amount to anything. Like, why do they transform? I don't know. <laughs> Truly good creativity is usually a lot more than a slight visual difference or a mismatch of various features. The features need to, like, tie together in some way. This is why no one talks about avatar animals, like they're like a beacon of creativity. At best, they look visually appealing, like the turtle ducks. But more often than not, they're just simply a visual mix with nothing else. 
A lot of the time, making it functional helps, or otherwise giving it a reason to be what it is. For instance, uh, every flavoured beans are designed to be fun. The illusion wall is designed to hide the wizarding world. Why does a Trixie transform while doing the mating dance? I don't know. Or With the door, it's like, bitch, just use a room. You walked into a house which already had rooms and opened a pocket dimension to another room. Why? I don't understand. <laughs> But, I don't know, perhaps I'm focusing on the wrong thing. Creativity is, after all, just one way you can engage an audience. For instance, I might read their inspiration as Harry Potter, but it might be something like Little Witch Academia. And to Little Witch's offence, I don't think it has that kind of creativity either. What Little Witch does have, however, is that it's animated by Studio Trigger. And while its world building isn't creative either, all of the magic is shiny and flowy, and even if it's generic, it looks super flashy and lends itself well to good animation. Compared to this, High Guardian Spice really doesn't have the animation to carry itself the same way Little Witch does. Even compared to cartoons, I really don't think this show has notable animation. Like, here's a hug and a spin in Steven Universe, here's a hug and a spin in High Guardian. Look, I'm glad the team uh, found more work after Zelda CDI, but I have to call it like I see it. <laughs> I am actually really sorry to the animators and writers who I'm roasting. It's nothing personal for what it's worth. Plenty of shows like this come and go and don't get this much scrutiny. You just got caught in the crossfire between bad management and abused consumer base. But hey, uh, taking brutal criticism I think is part of the job. Uh, that's the reality of working in this industry. Uh, to this show's credit, near the end of the season there is actually some really good animation. Like, so good I'm suspicious they outsourced it so they'd have something to use in the trailer. Like, here's a fight in the middle of the series for comparison, and here's the one at the end. The funny thing is, uh, this fight looks fucking awesome, right? Uh, it still doesn't use the magic of the world in the fight, ever. Th this character's a witch, by the way, and she's fighting the warrior in melee combat with her staff. And she doesn't use magic in the fight, ever. She doesn't even change the Terra Sphere into its ball form to throw her opponents off balance while they're like locked in a like a like a sword lock. It's like <laughs> Man, I don't know. What were they aiming for with this show? The magic isn't used for the creativity like Harry Potter, and it doesn't use it for visuals like Little Witch Academia. So it begs the question. Why is it here at all? Other than that, I really only remember a couple of shots, and with this being like a visual medium, you've really got to be aiming for at least striking visuals, like even if there's not much animation, otherwise it's just like, just write a book. <laughs> okay, so like what does this show, what does this show have? Well, the other main way High Guardian Spice tries to entertain you is the characters and writing. If nothing else, the show is trying to create enjoyable characters with some fun and funny emotional writing. And this is... I want to say shaky, the characters especially when they try to do character depth, uh, backstory and like emotional moments, but I do genuinely think at the start of the season, none of these characters are unlikable, and I think there's some good, funny and clever writing in the show. Some lines are perfect, some have potential and need a bit of work, some are dumb and should have been totally replaced. There's also some funny slapstick writing. Now one line that I want to focus on uh, that has potential is on the uphill train. Uh, they get a look at their hometown from up high, and they realize how small it is. Pebble looks so... small. I guess it was small the whole time. And we just didn't know. This is a good line. It has irony to it, that being that they're simply looking at their home from a distance, but now they interpret it in a way that makes them apprehensive, contrasting the warm comfort of home with a new foreboding energy. Good contrast. It also has a double meaning. They use small in a physical sense at first, but when Sage gets sad about it, it implies what she really means by small is in its importance relative to the rest of the world. Unfortunately, there's not quite enough logic for Sage to really interpret her hometown in this new way, or at least if there was, it wasn't emphasized enough. That might have been their goal with them taking this big journey, but I don't think that's enough to make them feel apprehensive. But like, if this was prefaced with a scene that demonstrated how in over their heads they were the second they left their hometown, then it would have made this line much, much stronger. Like, what if they actually tried to take a shortcut to High Guardian Academy on the broom and ended up getting lost, finding their lack of knowledge of magic and the outside world gets them into trouble, perhaps even like the broom gets broken, or perhaps they get mugged and realize that even in the big city, 
and when they're surrounded by people who could help them, without money they're effectively stranded. So when they perhaps get saved by a fully fledged guardian and finally get back on their journey, they realise their hometown was actually still close enough to see, and yet they were incapable of getting back there by themselves for help. It fills Sage with apprehension, and she says, I guess it was small the whole time, and we just didn't know. They're simply looking at their hometown from a distance, but this new experience causes her to interpret what was once homely and comforting as an indicator of how sheltered she didn't realise she was. Another line comes when they check out Lingarth and Rosemary sees a creature she's never seen before and she chases it off saying, My word! What is that? <laughs> Maybe it's got rabies! Come on, Sage! Do you want rabies? This line's good. The joke is that Rose is a very brash character who will get excited about anything new, even if it means charging into danger, and the more reserved and careful Sage can only think to interpret this as that she wants rabies as opposed to the inci excitement the prospect presents. Good irony. Getting excited about a concept like rabies is a hilarious contrast, and it's good characterization for both of them. Another line is, Why did you bring your mom's sword? You never know, Sage. Danger is like a flock of birds. It swoops all into your business when you least expect it. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, bad line. As far as I can tell, what they're attempting is to create an irony through a comparison of two completely unrelated things. We do this a lot in meme format. The joke with uh, a lot of meme templates is that the template will be from one thing, but then with very few edits, it happens to perfectly represent something else that's totally unrelated. The stronger the connection, the funnier the meme. Also, fun trivia, if you've ever seen someone notice that two things match up by coincidence and they say, that's ironic, and you've corrected them by saying, it's not ironic, it's appropriate, you didn't actually understand what they meant by ironic. What they were actually trying to say is that it's ironic that two completely unrelated things have a connection by complete coincidence. That shit blew my fucking mind when I worked that out. Anyway, so the joke here doesn't work because the connection is weak. Swooping into your business isn't even an inherent, well-known trait of birds or danger, so it just kind of feels lackluster. Also, danger is a very broad concept, uh, specificity is good for coincidence, so we're gonna go with the word sword instead. Which is why I'd go, swords are just like sewing kits. You don't think you need them until your stuffing comes out when you least expect it. The coincidences being sewing kits are also something you don't think you need until it's too late, as well as using stuffing in two different senses. This isn't meant to be laugh out loud funny for the record, you can definitely make a stronger coincidental connection to this, but that would take me a lot of time to find one. Anyway, right after this she waves the sword and almost hits Time, one of our four main characters. Uh, she starts out hating them and has a rough exterior, we'll get to her later. Similarly, we meet Parsley in this episode. She's a blacksmith, she fixes uh, the lock after it gets broken, she seems personable, cheerful, resourceful. Again, I don't think any of these characters are annoying. They all seem likeable, at least for now. They also kind of allude to some deeper reason she plans to go to the academy. Uh, it's not as interesting as it sounds. Regardless, this is all fine. In fact, there's actually a couple of funny lines here. You just got a glimpse about of a third of my brothers. In order of loudness, I think that was nettle, thistle, clove, twelve brothers? Yeah, I stopped counting after seven. Although it's fairly generic stuff, I'm pretty sure I, like I've heard it before. The last thing in this episode is about the locket. There was another writing thing that felt like a good idea but not so great in execution. When Rosemary first loses the locket, she says what's inside is irreplaceable. You think it must be something deep and meaningful when actually she just says it's a picture of her father's prized shortcake. This is a good joke. The idea of having something so mundane in a locket is good irony. Uh, but it's actually a double fake out. When the locket breaks, she takes the picture out and unfolds it. The wider picture is of her family and most notably her missing mother. And suddenly it makes sense why it's so precious to her. This is a good little twist, but again, I feel like we're missing the logic. Why did she put the shortcake front and center when what was really precious about it was her mother? It feels like it was just made to be a fake out without actually putting in the work to make the fake out work. <laughs> Which is disappointing because I actually feel like this is this is a good line and like really easy to fix. Just give Rosemary a character trait or belief that would make her want to hide it. How about a warrior never shows weakness? Boom, done. Ties into her mother's profession and it's what she wants to be. 
That'd give it a real gut punch too, because you go the whole episode with Rosemary trying to put on a brave face and be like, my mother's fine, she's just missing, we'll find her, and then you find out later she's actually secretly super fearful and sad about it. So much so she wants to keep a locket on her, but she doesn't want people to know, so she just makes it about cheesecake, but deep down she knows that a picture of her mother is always close by, even if she can't see it. Anyway, that's episode one. Uh, general thoughts, this show is basically a bland owl house. It's a lighthearted show with cheerful characters and funny emotional writing, but the reason Owl House is I think successful over this is the creativity and world building which I think is going to become like ever more obvious as we get into the main setting, the Academy, in episode 2. Do you want to see a great microcosm of this? Here is what the school bell is like in the Owl House. Here is what it's like in High Guardian. Yeah, Owl House has a little monster that screams when it's automatically hit every hour. High Guardian has a gargoyle that opens its mouth and makes the sound of a school bell. <sighs> so basically episode 2 is that they have their own version of Orientation Day called Disorientation Day, which is the name of the episode and again, like, it makes it sound like it's one of those quirky, magical school creativity things that like make me think it's inspired by Harry Potter, but before we send you off to class. Class? What about? What about orientation? No orientation, only disorientation. <laughs> Generally, taking away things doesn't constitute creativity. You gotta, you gotta make something. Speaking of, the old character who's part of the triad, the leaders of the school, is an attempt at making a quirky character too. She has some decent lines. Uh, some feel like they were trying to just just trying to be quirky. Um, As it is your first day of school, in case you forgot. Wh why would they forget? Is this a sarcastic remark? Why are you assuming they're forgetful? And then she randomly waves the stick around a bit without a good excuse. Uh, but to be fair, this line is good. Welcome to High Guardian Academy. Everybody leave! Anyway, the students are supposed to go to class to learn more about themselves and make up their own guardian vows based on their principle. And there's some interesting potential depth that could be tapped here, but it's mostly about introducing the school and its classes and... <sighs> Here's where the creativity really eats at the show. The classes you will see in the show and in this episode are... Ethics. Battle tactics. Sacred languages, blacksmithing, whatever the centaur teaches because she was on screen for 30 seconds and didn't say the name of the class. Oh, don't forget we have everything hours. That kind of sounds like a creativity magical school thing. What is that? What is everything hours? It's, it's where you, it's fucking, it's fucking free time. It's, you can do fucking, it's where you do whatever you fucking want. <sighs> well, maybe because you can do whatever you want, they'll at least... Pick something creative to do. I figured out my focus. What is it? Swordsing. Gonna swords it up. That's amazing, Rose. Whoa. <laughs> like, this is what makes the magical school setting work. The magical part. Otherwise, you're just going to school. And school is boring. And that's another thing. Because they split being a guardian into like four different categories to represent the main characters, warrior, ranger, mage, and blacksmith, it means that magic is only one quarter of the show. So it's like, how the fuck are you gonna make these classes interesting? They're not. That's the answer, they're fucking not. Like, there's a hilariously little attempt to make this interesting. Literally 30 seconds into the blacksmithing segment, Parsley makes perfect daggers and the teacher dismisses the class. I'm not kidding. They had the brilliant idea to make Hogwarts but with a D&D party and then they realized they had no fucking clue what to do with it. Where are you from? Pebble. It's a, that's, that's where I'm from. Pebble, great place. Small, but really memorable. You keep saying things in the show are memorable, but for some reason I remember nothing. To be honest, all of this could just be fixed by just integrating a little bit of magic into the warrior type stuff and having Sage just be the magic specialist. Maybe the others could use lighter and smaller magic and more focus on using it creativity, cre creative, creatively. Or they could have good knowledge of magical monsters and plants so that they can use their environment. Or, or they could use like a lot of enchanted tools and weapons and leave the casting up to the true magic classes, which would give you the perfect thing for Parsley to do because then you could like make a whole new creative process to blend enchantment magic with blacksmithing. It doesn't seem like there was any attempt at all, which I guess makes sense. Like this probably just wasn't even their goal, but like, 
What was their plan for these classes if not that? I will say the writing, the one thing of this show that occasionally does well, uh, does shine with Amarilth. She has genuinely strong one-liners that are worth pointing out. Uh, probably because she's a bully character and they don't have a way like, to like hold back the snark. I've read, or uh, my mother, she had a lot of books, so- Your family can read? That is wild. <laughs> you should apologize for that posture, sweetie. You look like an invertebrate. Also, Time has a genuinely good line in this episode too. I don't know. When will we have time to write stuff if we're going straight to class with no, uh, orientation? Sage, don't worry. We'll figure it out together. Yeah, you can help each other pack. The joke is that Rosemary says something encouraging, but Time uses the same sentence structure to give it an answer that's the exact opposite of her intention. Uh, good association of wrong contrast opposites. That's a fucking joke. That's how I define a joke. Good job. Uh, okay, what else? What else? Uh, <clears throat> Um, we get some basic exposition about new magic and old magic. Professor Carraway says it's an important foundation uh, for what they learn in new magic, like old magic is, uh, but he never actually defines what the difference is. Uh, this will be an important for a rant later. Also, a cat looks at time through a window. This is actually supposed to be a teaser and a mystery and I didn't even realize. Maybe, maybe put a little bit more emphasis, have the cat do something a little more human. <laughs> Cats look through windows at you all the time. Uh, there's a potion class that could have uh, been better. It felt very like rushed. The teacher poisons them within 30 seconds and Sage, who didn't drink the potion, uh, saves them all with her skill. Also, missed chance to be creative with the effects. Shouldn't have just been like visual differences. Interact with your environment more. Cause greater, greater like devastation or spectacle. Have more interesting interactions between the people with like their different like poison reactions. I don't know. I feel like if I rewrote this, I could have added like a, like I would have added like a bit more point to the poisoning. Maybe the potion teacher genuinely tries to trick her students uh, as part of like an overall lesson about building diligence everywhere. Like first rule about cures, don't drink poison in the first place. There is a good line here though. I don't trust it slash her. Okay, just fill out this form. What is this? It's where you indicate the kind of flowers you prefer at your funeral. <laughs> Again, she helps by providing something that's actually the opposite of what she wants. Good irony. Anyway, all of these classes are supposed to result in our main characters having a better idea of what they want to uphold as guardians. And this could be a really good way to show depth. A uh, good example, the old lady gives her vows and as an example, and it has some, like, some really strong, interesting principles. I vow to stay curious and engaged, to look at the world with a questioning eye. I shall use my agility to protect what is precious, even if it brings about my own end. More of this would have been awesome. I think emphasizing this sort of thing for our main characters would have been great too, or since this was supposed to be an example of a good guardian vow, the main characters should have maybe started with something small but specific that you could craft into a more concrete belief as the show progresses. So by the end of the season they have some serious conviction in their beliefs that they want to like uphold. Unfortunately a lot of the time the attempted depth of this show doesn't come from interesting core principles or beliefs, it comes from melodrama and really poorly written melodrama at that. But we'll get to that, that's much later. Though I do like this scene for like what little character insight you get from our main characters. I aim to leave a legacy. Direct and diplomatic in the toughest situations. Fortitude. Loyalty. I vow to be self-reliant. I believe that we can all be remarkable. We must be. Of course as interesting as this scene is, none of it matters and we never go back to it or develop it. I just really wish there was there was a plan to actually show these opinions through big actions later. You would have had some like good character depth, but we really just don't. If you had this vow thing be have like some more specifics that you really plan to demonstrate through the character's choices, it would have been like, so good. Also, there should have been some kind of consequence to give this all meaning. Like at the end of the school year, you have to lock in your vows, and if you break them, there's punishments. Then it would have felt like it actually mattered and was going to come back. Uh. Recording this afterwards to add insult to injury. I've just realized that these vows aren't actually specific to each of the triad. There's just three different sets of vows and you have to take them all. They just read out one part each. That's why she says, Listen here, children, to the true code of the guardians. <sighs> so you can't even choose your own fucking vows. These are just the vows you take. They just wanted them to experiment with it just to tell them how to actually do it. <laughs> Episode 3 opens on her breaking her fucking sword. That's a good opening, actually. My eyes went wide open. Unfortunately, 
doesn't mean anything either. It'll just get restored because it's a magical world, of course. This is your first, yeah, this is your first indication that the magic in this world is purely for solving plot issues rather than its own engagement benefit. So what this sword breaking is really for is actually is to set a path to a bunch of exposition about Rose and her mother. This is probably like a weird tangent because not many people are going to know about this, uh, but I'm reminded of quotes of loot uh, in the book The Name of the Wind. Uh, spoilers for Name of the Wind. I say this because it has like a really good example of how the same general rules about character deaths can actually be applied to objects, and it can create for some really strong engagements. When Quoth is a child, his family and clan of traveling players are brutally massacred. The trauma locks a lot of his memories away for a time, uh, and he survives alone in the forest, but when he establishes his basic needs, he begins to play his lute again, the last thing he has to remember of his family. And he just plays and plays and plays until finally the strings break. And that becomes the inciting incident to leave the safety of the forest, because he has to find a city and buy new strings. So it does like an amazing job of like establishing how much this loot means to him. But when he gets to the city, he becomes impoverished, mugged, beaten, and worst of all, his loot gets smashed. Quite frankly, I think the destruction of the loot is more emotionally impactful than his family dying, which is why I say character deaths aren't actually exclusive to characters. Ultimately, it's about investment and the things that happen to what we're invested in. Quoth then spends years on the streets, but when he finally gets his shit together and he uses his hard-earned money to pay for a caravan to take him out of the city, he learns one night, while they sit in front of a campfire, that one of his fellow passengers has a loot of their own. And I love the scene that follows. But I'm not gonna tell you. Ha! Fuck you. But if you're angry at me, then you get what I mean. Investment is powerful, even when instilled in inanimate objects. Anyway, it's, it's just hard for me to see something like this and have it like not have any kind of consequence attached to it. The episode had a great hook, but it didn't do anything with it. It was just a lead into some like mother related exposition. Anyway, mum flashbacks, go! Good. Plant your feet firmly, find your center. Good job on that stance, daughter. It's a pity the animators couldn't represent it properly because holy shit, that looks like a really bad stance. Also, you know how you have the whole Kudere arc uh, with time where she's like part of the main cast, uh, but she's like hostile at first? Well, get this. You find out that she's roommates with Parsley last episode, and this episode, she continues to chide Rose and Sage, you know, as before, hard exterior, but she calls Parsley by a nickname. And like the characters comment on it. But I'm on my way to archery. First lesson is how to take pride in your weapons. Listen, you pointy. Later, Parse. Parse, that's new. Did, did you want to do that on fucking screen? Time is honestly fucking busted. This is seriously a microcosm of our entire character. The whole point of this character type is that they develop by us finding out why they put up a cold exterior, and then using that, we break down their tough exterior until they're part of the main cast. But there seemingly isn't a true core reason for this cold exterior, which is why it seemingly breaks down off screen before she even gets to the main crux of her character, that being her daddy issues. Like, I, I don't get why you would do this stuff off screen. What's the point in character development if you don't show it happening? Like a good example of this would be like Robin from One Piece, where similarly she doesn't show out uh, any emotion outside of tiny hints and actively pushes away uh, growing closer with anyone. Her backstory gives context to this, that being that because she's wanted by the government, she can't make friends without them eventually giving up her, uh, giving her up out of pressure or betraying her for money. So ultimately, what makes emotions finally bubble up in her and spill out is when the group of friends of the main cast, who she's sure would just be like everyone else, follows her across the world, busts down the gates of a navy base, and literally declares war on the entire fucking world government, asking her to admit to them that she wants to be with them. Why do I keep doing emotional case studies? It makes me cry every fucking time when I search up clips. Uh, anyway, the point is there is there has to be like a reason for the closed offness and then a reason for it to break. We'll get into time more later, but this super fucking doesn't happen. Anyway, each character in this episode has their own subplot. Parsley, for instance, goes to blacksmithing class, bangs on some metal, and the teacher's like, go realign this painting, and kicks her out of the class to go on a little adventure. I wasn't kidding, they really just don't know what to do with blacksmithing as a class. I'm pretty sure this is- <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is actually the last blacksmithing class in the show too. <laughs> it's supposed to be like a test on how to use a single tool for multiple things, uh, but hilariously none of those things have anything to do with blacksmithing, she just 
She uses it to dig a hole. To be fair though, this thing with the picture changing with the angle uh, is genuinely pretty fun and creative. So in the Rosemary subplot, she talks to Professor Carraway and finds out he knows her mother. He talks about their adventures together where they like run from a manticore and get cornered on a cliff. You're holding a pterosphere, buddy. I know that can turn into a broomstick. I've fucking seen it. Anyway, Rosemary was sad about breaking her mum's sword, but then it's she finds out her mum broke it in the same place too, so it's fine. Like, like, see what I mean when I said there really wasn't any consequence to any of this? <laughs> I think this was literally just to get to this conversation, which, I mean, does have merit. It's cool to find out about a connection to her mother. Uh, it just felt like it could have been, like, more. Speaking of, another thing that comes up is this. Is, is that your sister? It's me, actually. You are a girl? <laughs> I'm transgender. Let's get... Political! So personally, I don't care about diversity. I'm neutral to it. I, but I appreciate that some people do, and I want to go over the theory on not making it feel forced, because I think having an openly transgender character is possible without making it feel forced. So first off, this isn't the worst example. The, the logic is there for one. They're talking about Rosemary's mother, and they're going through a picture book, so it makes sense why this would like come up in conversation. But it's still missing something. That is, how is it supposed to engage me as an audience member to know that this character is transgender? And I bet some people will turn their nose up at this and say, why does it need a reason? Trans people exist in society, so naturally they should exist in our stories too, even if it's not engaging. But we don't arbitrarily add random coughs, sneezes, and stuttering speech to our dialogue even though it happens in reality. Nor do we have our characters randomly go to the bathroom just for the sake of it, or show every one of their 3,099 fucking push-ups the MC does in his training arc. So why should we arbitrarily add this even if we know it's not inherently engaging? And you're like, Psh, it's just one little line, why are you molding over it? No, no, you don't understand. <laughs> every time you add anything to a story, you always do it in the interest of engaging an audience, even in like the tiniest little details. But I'll give you an example. In Ruby, there's a scene with a gay couple that feels very forced, but it literally only comes from like one single line. Everything else is fine. I'll show you. Jean and I are the only two living away from home. I guess he just wanted to be like his big sis. I, uh... Aw, you didn't deny it. <laughs> Everyone, this is my wife, Terracotta. Hey there. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Why, hello there. Wow, quite a party, you weren't kidding. Hun, can I get some help, please? And you're sure it's all right if we stay with you? Of course. And you're probably thinking, well, that makes sense. Of course she would introduce her wife. But that's not the issue. The issue is it doesn't have any engagement benefit. You know why I know this? Well, because one, they only introduce the wife to everyone, but not each individual to the wife. Uh, why does it take one too much time for one and not the other? And two, uh, perhaps more important, much more importantly, uh, because we don't do this with straight couples. I, I actually got Twitter to give me like a bunch of scenes like this where uh, the cast of a show meets an established character's significant other, and I looked through as many examples as I could that I could like both easily access and knew the context for, and I couldn't find any where they just do the introduction just for the sake of it. In Avengers, it's funny because oh, despite that the couple ahead. is kissing, Tony assumes Hawkeye this can't have a family and she must be some kind of agent. Laura. In contrast to that, he reinforces it's the truth by giving her her name, and when the kids join, Tony, still in disbelief, says the kids are smaller agents. smaller agents. In Firefly, it's played as a joke because five seconds ago he didn't even know he was married, nor did any of the cast. In Trains, Planes, and Automobiles, the point is this dude doesn't have a family to go home to, so introducing his family to him isn't just introducing them, it's an emotional moment for this character. In Full Metal Alchemist, Maze Hughes' wife and daughter are first introduced as part of a joke that he's reaching for his gun when he's actually just characterization for him being a family man who's obsessed enough to keep a photo on him at all times and is excited to have anyone meet them. And then when they actually meet at dinner, the only one who actually has an official introduction is the two MCs because it's a lead in to the daughter describing them and making a short joke. The wife doesn't even speak to introduce herself. No one introduces her like, like, like this is my wife, you know? She's just there and the plot assumes you know. Everything you do must be done in the interest of engaging the audience. So when you stop to show a new character this front and center and spend this long expositing who they are and the fact they're a couple without any engagement attached, your audience starts looking for an ulterior motive to explain why you're wasting their time. Normally the answer is, oh, they're just not good at writing. 
which is at least understandable, but when the reason can be perfectly explained by a popular school of thought, suddenly it feels like your time is intentionally being wasted and that's when it becomes jarring. It's the exact same reason advertisements, product placement, and like any kind of ham-fisted messaging from either side of politics can feel annoying. It's because your audience came for entertainment and they can tell you're intentionally not prioritizing that entertainment. If you're gonna introduce any new character with this much focus, you gotta have it be about the engagement, not the fact that she's gay. If it were me, I'd give her an actual character, something we can use to create something fun. I'd have her be a locksmith or like a thief, and you introduce her by her breaking into her own house, either by habit or just for fun. The main cast freak out when she busts in because they think someone's like, like fucking busting into the house, but then the wife goes, oh, don't worry, that's just my wife. There, done, easy. Now the introduction is part of a joke, but you still got to explicitly state your gay relationship. See, this is why I don't mention the gay couple at the start of High Guardian Spice, because they don't do this. They're just there, and it's up to the audience to work out their relationship, so it doesn't take up any screen time. Although, I do get kind of twinges of it, uh, like the, the, the feeling of like forced diversity when they hold the frame a bit too long to do some lovey-dovey shit. And that's not to say you can't have your couples be lovey-dovey. Uh, it's just that it's too bland to constitute an engagement worthy of any screen time. If you found a way to make these interactions more uh, extreme or creative, or use it to characterize them and their personalities rather than just give them generic couple shit, then you would have gotten away with it. And that's my point, if you're dead set on diversity, you need to make sure you have an excuse in an engagement. For races and sexualities, this is very easy. You just need to make them as engaging as the non-diverse equivalent. Like if you're doing black characters, for instance, you just need to make sure their design is as good as your white characters. When I first did a video on this sort of thing, I had a different approach, but I realized I didn't, it didn't like explain why some black characters felt forced to me. And at first I was just like, oh no, am I actually racist and I just don't know about it? But it wasn't all black characters, it was just some. And I realized the difference was the character designs, they looked bad, which which makes sense. Obviously, uh, we as a society are gonna have less practice designing minority characters, and there's gotta be some obstacles with that. I mean, with black characters, the outline and features are still all drawn in black, so it doesn't contrast the majority tone like white characters do, and the features don't pop the same way. If you don't know how to work around that, then it's going to look like you intentionally included a character you didn't know how to design when you could have just done more of what you were good at. But it can definitely be done. There are some really good looking black characters, especially if you look at anime, which I think only does it when the artist knows they're good enough at it. Characters like Keelik uh, and Canary are just like, perfect. Also, changing the races of established characters is another trap a lot of writers fall into, but I think that's obvious. I mean, that's practically just like willingly going off model. Of course that feels forced to people. <laughs> But yeah, so as long as the character designs look good and your couples have good chemistry and solid development, people will love them. But transgender characters are kind of tricky. You could just do it the same way it's done with gay couples and black characters, where they're just kind of there and they're treated no different from the straight couples or white characters. But the problem is, no one's going to know they're transgender, and you don't want that. Generally, the goal with being transgender is to not have people recognize you as transgender, but if diversity is your goal, you need to find a way to explicitly state it, which is... Which is how you get shit like this. What brought you out here to Andromeda? Back home, I was filling test tubes in some dead-end lab. People knew me as Stefan, but that was never who I was. I knew what I could do, and I knew who I wanted to do it as. Hanley Abrams, Andromeda Explorer. That's me. Feels good. Feels right. Congratulations. Talk about a whole new life. So what brought you to Andromeda? Hi, I'm transgender, that's why. <laughs> but even if you got the logic for it, you can't do this because it still has no engagement benefit. But I think there are places we can look to for advice on this. Firstly, there's an anime called Wandering Sun which is explicitly about trans characters, and none of that feels forced to me. And I'm pretty sure it's because, like, it does a lot more than just have the character say, I'm transgender, or explain to you the definition. If I remember correctly, the story was a lot more focused on the opinions the characters had about their feelings, not just describing the feelings themselves. And when they did, that information was always conveyed in creative ways. Like it centered around a school play about Romeo and Juliet, with two characters playing Romeo and Juliet being unhappy about the gender of their role, and like the possibility there's like the possibility of them switching. 
It's also had like a much more heavy focus on like group drama, with the story te uh, taking place amongst a cast of other likeable characters who are all friends, and the bonds that break and form amongst them due to the change in the, in the story. Like when the MC secretly dresses in her sister's clothes and then gets caught, that ripples out and creates reactions within what was before a normal group of friends. So that's that's one thing, that gives me a bit of ideas. Um, another example I want to use is Onion Capon from Attack on Titan. Who isn't trans, he's black, but the fact he's black is explicitly stated. We actually spend time on it, but again, it doesn't feel forced. This is probably because this is funny by itself, just because of how fresh it is. But I think what really makes it work is how he responds. いろんな奴がいた方が面白いってな。君たちユミルの民も同じさ。俺たちは求められたから存在する。誰が僕らを作ったの？シソユミルに力を与えた存在。神だよ。そう考えるやつもいる。考えるだけなら自由だろう。do you see how the fact he's black becomes a springboard for both an interesting opinion he has and something that links into what's already established? I think that's what we want to aim for, and I have a decent idea how, because there's one line in this trans scene, uh, in High Guardian Spice, that I actually really like. I was born into a female body, but it wasn't the right body for me, so I used new magic to change it. Cool! You can do that? I is that kind of transformation magic permanent? I take a potion once a month to keep the spell active. This could really be interesting. I love the fact that they decided to use magic to change up how the characters in the show think about and deal with a normal human problem. Like, like this feels like world building, doesn't it? Unfortunately, it's kind of a throwaway line and doesn't even get brought up again, even though they have another gender questioning character in the show who has a whole arc about this. Even though the solution is right there, why don't you know about this? <laughs> and that's disappointing. I feel like if you really fleshed out the mechanics of the gender changing potion and really integrated its usage into the world, you can definitely make a transgender character feel like a genuine part of the world building instead of just something thrown in for the sake of it. Maybe we could have a cost attached to it, uh, but Professor Caraway here has some kind of interesting opinion about it, similar to how Onion Capon has an opinion on being black. This would move him away from a trans character whose character is that he's trans to his own character that has his own interesting and unique opinions on the topic that ties back into our world building. That would give you all of the diversity of an explicit trans character without having wasting anyone's time where you're not engaging the audience. Unfortunately this video is already too long and I don't have the time to rewrite this, uh, but I do want to, because it's an interesting challenge. So I will write this when we get later in the series, because it will still be relevant. I just don't have the time to do it right now. Now Sage's plotline is probably the most interesting. We get her feelings on growing up using old magic and her struggles learning new magic. Again, we don't really define what the difference is other than new magic is somehow a lot more flexible and is usable with a terra sphere where old magic is more associated with much slower and more methodical things like drawing runes and making potions like she's doing right here. This is all fine for this part of the plot. I can't wrap my head around it yet because they haven't defined it, but I'm excited to learn more. Just as long as they don't do something stupid like explicitly state that new magic is totally limitless and has zero drawbacks and then retroactively try to justify why old magic would ever be used or why they keep making their definitions more and more muddy because the teacher who says new magic is all you need was literally doing the potions class which I thought was an old magic thing because why the fuck would you need ingredients in this, in this whole process if new magic is described as doing anything and if it is new magic then why the fuck could Sage save everyone on the first day of class? I thought she came to learn new magic, in fact her family hates it so why would she ever- I am so fucking confused and angry. <sighs> But we'll get to it when we get to it. Honestly, at this point in the show, I thought High Guardian, High, High Guardian Spice was like mediocre to okay. But the later we get into the show, the more obvious it's going to become that magic isn't a genuine part of the world as much as it is a convenient tool to do whatever they fucking feel like with. And the more they do whatever they feel like with it, the more confusing it gets to try and understand, and the more it hurts my fucking head when they try to make moments with like old magic and new magic. And I know people might be like, it's a kid's show. You're not going to get a hard magic system. Firstly, weirdly not a kid's show. I don't mess with that shit. Be in trouble for the shit he said to me. Secondly, I'm not asking for hard magic. I'm asking you to not try and engage me with world building if you're just going to contradict it later. Your world building doesn't even have to be like complicated. Perfect example, Owl House. To make a spell, you need to make a circle. Bigger the circle, bigger the spell. 
super easy, consistent rule, ties all the different magic types together without confusing people. But this is like, this is like it wants to do both. It makes different categories like it's a hard magic system and then pussyfoots around actually explaining them to stop you from like working out that they don't actually have any definitions. And as I say, it's not a problem yet in this point of the story, but strap in, cause man does it get fucking infuriating later. Anyway, this scene is actually kind of fun and has some good mystery. Sage makes a potion, Amarilla fucks it up cause she's a bitch, and it gets spilled on a cat, and makes it buff and sentient, and it decides it has a mission. This is actually pretty fun and mysterious, I like it. Chaos ensues as they try to return the cat to normal, and time joins them to help. As it turns out, the cat's mission is to go to this tree and stab a staff in it to reduce the rot, a strange infection that's apparently been taking over Time's home. And now, it's here. Why the cat knew about this is actually a little decent mystery as well. It has the weirdness I typically look for in good mystery, and does actually have a good answer. You find out later in the series that the other cat you saw in the window before is actually a villain in disguise who's trying to propagate the rot. So this cat knew, but couldn't do anything about it. My only complaint is the other cat really should have been like shown and utilized more before the reveal came up because I didn't even really notice it. Oh, also finding a way to reduce the rot is time's like main mission apparently, uh, but you can just stab the staff into it because that's just what we saw, but she never even investigates it as an option, so that's, that's weird. But that is episode three. It is also unfortunately all I have time for. If I try to do the full video now, the animated dormitory project will fucking end before I get the video out. But hey, since we're here, let's make a little game of this. You want me to finish this whole series with these kind of videos? Blow this charity up. For every $500 donated to this charity, I'll do another episode of High Guardian Spice with the exception of the last episode, which I'll only do if the charity is fully funded. So, renew your vows to the Pirates of the West, show the world piracy is a service problem, not a money problem, pirate your anime, but support your animators, you scallyweebs. Thank you for that one, Kaiju. Uh, don't sue me for copyright. I know that would be funny. Don't do it, I swear to fucking god. <laughs>